Welcome, everyone. So strange to hear your voice on a microphone, oh, but I guess we're all sharing that, right? Um, before I start, I, I just want to thank Raisa and Yusi for the work that we've done um, on the Art Eco Project and this book that's coming out, um, Art, Eco Justice, and Education. And several of you in the audience are contributors to that book, so, you know, thank you too. Um, and I also just want to thank, I mean, it feels like I need to thank my Finnish family here, so, you know, thank you also to Veli Mativari, who's like the reason I'm even able to make this connection with you all, my good friend. Um, Vesa, who I don't see here, but who is just one of my brothers as well, Ole Yuka, um, you know, you see us as well, Yanni, uh, Antisari. Um, and then I'm really happy to have my students here. So, um, and Derek, of course, thank you so much for the retreat and for your talk yesterday. It was, it's just so wonderful to have all of this great spirit um, in the room. Okay, so before I start, I just want to give a quick review um, of the eco-justice framework and give you a little bit of an idea of where in this framework I'm going to be mostly talking from. So, um, Raisa started us yesterday morning with uh, a, a kind of um, introduction to this, but the eco-justice framework relies on three strands, basically, generally. The first is a uh, cultural ecological analysis, which is really um, looking at the deep cultural, ideological, discursive roots of intersecting social and ecological crises. So we don't see those as separate. We see those problems as um, a result of a way of thinking and being on the planet that's very destructive. The second strand is we call following Chet Bowers, who I should also thank. He passed this summer, but he's a foundational influence um, to us and was a dear mentor. Um, we call it revitalizing the commons, but this is really about identifying in our current lives and historically and diversely across the planet those practices and relationships, traditions. Um, they're about mutual aid and care um, and um, are really built in the relationships that we make with each other and with the larger living world. And that's really where I'm going to be talking mostly today. I mean, you can't really not talk about these other pieces, but I'll be looking at the commons, what we call the commons. And I have to also say, and I don't think this comes out in my paper as well, that these are, these are those practices and relationships that are non-monetized. They don't require us to pay. Right? Which we, we have to pay for almost everything else. But, and the commons are being undermined by practices and processes of enclosure that force us to pay for what we used to not have to pay for. And then the final one, which I get directly from Wendell Berry, um, the great American conservationist, um, the idea of imagination, which is about learning to imagine beyond the limits of what we feel is inevitable, learning to imagine the places that we believe we ought to be able to live in, right? So, and I don't mean just in the future. I mean, how do we want to live now? And um, what should we be doing to make that happen? So they're all very interrelated, as you'll see. But and one last little <laughs> comment before I start, um, uh, by way of a little bit of an apology. I don't usually do this, but this paper is, um, was written a long time ago, actually, and I'm, it's being published in this book because it's one of the only times I've explicitly talked about art. Um, I'm not an artist, really. I guess everyone's an artist, whereas you see, right? But um, anyway, you'll see why, why it's in this book. Several years ago, I sat in the small auditorium of Thurkle Elementary School on the northwest side of Detroit. The air was alive with voices as children filed in and teachers and staff and community members beamed and hugged happy greetings. We were there to celebrate, and the place was rich with it. Twelve watercolor paintings were lined up, works of art completed by the Thurkle students in response to the question, 
What do I want my community to look like? Four had been selected to be digitally blown up and transferred onto large canvases that were now hanging on the outside walls of the school. As part of a joint effort by the school and several other community organizations, the children had created powerful representations of their love and hope for this place they identify as their community. And the people in this school were taking that offering very seriously, thanking them for that vision like their lives depended on it. Love was an exchange here, and the air snapped and crackled with it. It prickled my skin and welled up in my throat, a kind of collective electricity. As I drove home that day, my body still humming, my thoughts were on that love and the idea of place and community that was celebrated at Thurkle. I was transported to another place and another watercolor in process 30 years before, probably more like 45 years before <laughs> now. <laughs> Driving along in my car on I-94, I found myself sitting on some rocks in the middle of the little river in northern New York, the tires of my bike still spinning where I had laid it in the grassy ditch nearby. I had ridden here, a bit wobbly, with my sketch pad and packet of paints tucked under my arm, thinking that I'd try to get something down on paper about this spot that I loved so much. The water rushed cold around my feet, through my toes as I balanced there, dipping my brush into the stream to dab at the dried squares of paint in my case, dripping greens and golds, blues and yellows on my paper. I looked at a bridge, a heavy, dark structure we called King Iron. It created an odd contrast over the dancing sun-dappled water, and I struggled to put it, the sunlit stream below and the grassy banks on the page. This is the actual bridge. And where I was sitting was actually beyond, there's like a little rapids right below um, on the other side. I remember the excitement, frustration, and desire welling up in me, pushing me to say something about what I felt so strongly in my limbs, in my gut, in my core. I now know that it wasn't the bridge or the stream alone that I was trying to capture. It was all of it, the land itself, the grassy fields, the rolling hills, the shoreline where my grandpa fished <clears throat> some afternoons away, bringing us smiles and a creel full of brookies for dinner. It was all the talk at the dinner table. It was the way the sun danced on the water and warmed my back, and the memories of being with friends as we rode our horses into the river to swim and play just downstream on a summer's afternoon. My grandfather's farm, where my mother grew up, is within sight of where I sat to paint that day. Her stories of riding her own horse along these country roads and through the, those fields draws my own connection deeper. I hear her clearly when she says the horses raised her, the horses and this land, her sisters, and the generations in our family that came before. As a girl, this was my community. This stream and the hills, roads, woods, and fields, the horses, and all the people and their stories about life here. They were my extended neighborhood, connecting me to generations of people who had farmed here, family, I didn't know it then, but this is where my heart and spirit, my initial deep connection to justice, my love for the world, and my decision to teach against suffering was made. This was where I learned to belong, my commons. <clears throat> my homeland is, very different, is a very different place um, than the streets of Detroit depicted by the Thurkle kids. While the scene I yearned to capture was much more traditionally pastoral, the Thurkle children depicted buildings, cars, trees, people, and streets, a cityscape. What is shared in each of these efforts, however, is a clear sense of place and belonging, a desire to be part of the commons, all those shared relations of mutual aid and well-being among people and with the landscape. For the kids in Detroit and their families, the commons include the streets, sidewalks, parks, and the weed-strewn lots where pheasants, fox, groundhogs dwell, as well as the language, practices, traditions, and relationships held in common. The commons include all the stuff of day-to-day -day life put in place over generations, mostly in order to live together safely and happily. 
The love in the air that day at Thurkle was generated by the connections made within those common practices and relations as they are experienced in a particular place by particular people. The vision of well-being and hope depicted by the kids' drawings and the, des <clears throat> and the desire of those people to protect what is healthy in all of this. It played on us all erotically. It connected me almost immediately via my body to my own home place and the deep love I learned there. In this sense, the commons is erotic space made of interconnection and relationships that are generative. Susan Edgerton calls this sense of place, the land, and one's community in one's body, eco-erotic love. Here, I examine eros as that energy that plays on us, within and among our bodies, as we seek to connect with others and, out, and the outside world via our interpretive efforts. In the pre-Socratic philosophy of Aristophanes, eros is the moving by, it is the movement binding the universe together, a connective force of passion born in the earth itself. According to uh, Birch, reading Plato, it is a complement of reason that could move humans toward a moral or ethical way of life. I wish to argue for Eros as necessary to a specific earthbound wisdom. I use the concept of eros defined simply as embodied passion and connection to analyze how we come to love places via our bodies, our words, and our art in our day-to-day -day life. I distinguish what I call eco-erotic experiences from other embodied, centrally stimulating experiences that we may have with the land. Clearly, human beings experience and interpret a wide range of emotions and passions, from fear and anger to serenity and joy, in relation to the world around them. The world's mysteries play on us in all kinds of sensual <clears throat> ways, as David a Abram has so beautifully demonstrated, including ways that make us recoil and desire separation. But here I'm most interested in those embodied experiences that draw us closer, that create connection and pleasure, happiness, awe, and thus could move us to protect each other and the life systems we live in. I wish to argue for eros as necessary to a specific earthbound wisdom. Devalu oops. Devalued in contemporary thought by rationalist worldviews that prioritize man over woman, mind over body, and culture over nature, eros bl blurs these imposed hierarchized boundaries and connects us and our sense-making desires to the larger world. Resulting from our embodied interpretive meetings with the living world, Eros is a form of love that charges the will toward well-being. <clears throat> Using this definition, I find important links to the notion of the commons as it draws together with culture, landscape, and what Barry calls creatureliness. The commons includes the ways that humans all over the world have historically attempted to sustain themselves <coughs> excuse me, in communities and in connection to the land. The word commons comes from ancient English usage, whereby the land required to keep animals and grow crops, or the water needed for common consumption, for example, were shared and protected by people within communities according to a recognition of the biosystem's particular carrying capacity, which determined the rights and obligation of those who used it. Thus, beyond a limited definition of the commons as shared land, it also included all the other symbolic or cultural forms, the institutions, languages, practices, discourses, traditions, that bind communities together in service to one another. Since neither the state nor the market determines it, the commons is neither public nor private, nor is it de defined uh, by infinitely expanding consumerism, as in market-based systems. It is, rather, defined by, by limits that are understood by those who regulate it. Looking etymologically, Gary Snyder explains, the word has an instructive history. It is formed of co, together, with moin, held in common. But the Indo-European root may means basically to move, to go, to change. This had an archaic special meaning of 
exchange of goods and services within a society as regulated by common law. <clears throat> I think it might well refer back to gift economies. The gift must always move. The root comes into Latin as munus, service performed for the community, and hence municipality. <clears throat> Also reading this passage by Snyder, Susan Griffin pushes us to disrupt our internalized divisions between body and mind, culture and nature, to recognize that we connect to each other and to the world in and through our bodies as a matter of survival. <clears throat> every meeting and thus every exchange that connects us is experienced in the body and is sacred. Our bodies mediate the world. And there is eros in those meetings that binds us together, an embodied connection that pushes us toward the need to care for the other as we care for ourselves, and as a matter of survival and of love, happiness, and pleasure. And this is Griffin. To exist in a state of communion is to be aware of the nature of existence. This is where ecology and social justice come together with the knowledge that life is held in common. Whether we know it or not, we exist because we exchange, because we move the gift. And the knowledge of this is as crucial to the condition of the soul as its practice is to the body. Thus, Eros is created in the commons, moving us to make art that attempts to say something about the world, in this essay, I look to the relation among eros, language, and the creation of the commons as critical to, to educational endeavor. <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> if we are to stem the tide of destruction wreaking havoc on our human communities, we must connect it to the destruction of the larger life systems and the mindset underlying both. We will need teachers in public schools who recognize and are able to create classroom practices that encourage an eco-erotic love, and thus inspire students who can protect the fragile relationship of their human communities with the ecosystems upon which we depend. Education as an ethical endeavor must attend to our erotic connections in the world around us, the landscape, urban or rural, the practices, the languages, the relationships that can sustain life, as well as those that create havoc. This relationship between Eros and the Commons became clear to me in Detroit, both as I engaged with the Thurkle Elementary students and their families, and as I have witnessed the revitalization work being done in neighborhoods there. The work among grassroots activists with, <clears throat> with neighborhood families to clean up brown fields and transform abandoned lots into gardens and urban farms is saturated with meeting and exchange of work for work, of intergenerational knowledge, of stories, and all kinds of teaching and learning oriented toward taking care of each other, connecting across differences. Even while these people may not be completely or immediately successful in their efforts, the relationships being created, the care being offered, received, and exchanged is really what matters. It's what the Thurkle kids were trying to get into those paintings, and everybody knew it that day. I don't mean to imply that because there is this effort of, to revitalize the Detroit commons in these neighborhoods, everything is rosy. Cornell West has written extensively about the nihilism that pervades African American communities, devastated by the kind of economic neglect and abandonment, abandonment we see in Detroit. When the auto industry moved out, taking with them most of the white community, jobs were lost, the tax base collapsed, and African American community was trapped. More recently, state-mandated school closing, over 100 since 2009, including Thurkle Elementary, sadly, anti-democratic imposition of emergency managers, water shutoffs, and illegal foreclosures in preparation for a new Detroit fuel radical activism to reclaim the city and ward off bone-deep hopelessness. Urban blight pervades, youth homicide is high, and police brutality is among the most serious concerns that people express. These are all consequences of an old process at the heart of modern capitalism, whereby the commons are enclosed, bought up, 
privatized, and eventually controlled by industrial and political interests, thus denying people access to community-shared land, work, and decision-making processes. Yet, in the midst and in spite of this nightmare of dispossession and displacement, a broad range of community builders, artists, educators, and neighborhood folk have greeted me each time we meet with their generosity of spirit and incredible willingness to energize the community. I have watched while a group of artists, muralists, poets, and songwriters engage a large group of, of volunteers to clean up a lot that surrounded that, and the surrounding streets and then organize us all to work together on a gorgeous public mural. I've seen them working with kids and adults, bringing complex theory and background information about poetry and the history of mural making in other cities, guiding their students toward comp competence <coughs> in, in poetry of their own lives that deals explicitly with the realities of their city. Much of the, this community work is done without monetary return. It is done out of deep love for their neighbors and the ground they stand on. If Eros is the building connective force of passion born in our relationship with the earth itself and our immersion in its life forces, it is what produces the energy driving these activist educators and artists to reclaim and protect this place with their particular poetics, their aesthetic and ethical sense-making. Where there is eros, there is sure to be education. Both are made in relationships where differences make a difference and, an and animate the desire for the good, even when this desire is surrounded by seemingly hopeless conditions. When we think about education in the commons and the art that might support it or grow from it, we recognize a kind of holistic interdependence with the more than human world where we participate in a set of patterns that connect and regenerate, connect and regenerate, connect and regenerate. Coming to terms with our responsibility in those processes requires a particular form of wisdom, a form of a collaborative intelligence with what Gregory Bateson calls an ecology of mind. <clears throat> so here we go with Gregory Bateson. Gregory Bateson wrote over 50 years ago, Sometimes, sometime, sometime close to when I sat in that stream with my paper and my colors, and not long after the big three automakers abandoned Detroit, quote, lack of syst systemic wisdom is always punished, and the creature that wins against its environment destroys itself. At the heart of Bateson's work is his insistence that wisdom consists in understanding our embeddedness in the systemic nature of all life, and the ways that differences as the effects of relational patterns pervade those systems creating life itself. Difference is the moving elemental force of this overriding system <coughs> linking individual, society, and ecological system. For Bateson, epistemological error in the rationalist paradigm initiated a destructive process, bringing us to imminent ecological disaster. This paradigm is based upon the belief in the hyper-separation between human, the human mind and the world beyond, <coughs> and represents perhaps the most insidious form of enclosure, whereby the human species is set over and against the larger community of life, which means itself. In contrast, Bateson argued that mind is located in the relationships among all elements encompassing the whole ecological system, with human communities included. For Bateson, mind consists of cybernetic patterns of communication that create differences that make a difference within the biological as well as cultural systems we live in. Understanding and protecting this complex system of mind is what constitutes wisdom for Bateson. And such wisdom is at the heart of the commons, which we create via specific interpretive decisions the sense-making that gets encoded in our relationships. We make sense as cultural beings, but our sense is not the world itself. And Bateson tells us this interpretive differentiating process that we use to create knowledge, culture, identity, and our understanding of place is also at work in the natural world itself, moving and engaging us to, as participants in its communicative processes. 
In the West, we are born to a kind of hubris that denies that intelligence created within such complex systems of communication could exist anywhere but within the human mind, which, ex which is exercised upon the natural system and not within it. But insisting that all our words, thoughts, stories, songs, knowledge, paintings, and so on participate in a larger ecology of mind, Bateson points out that no part of such an internally interactive system can have unilateral control over the remainder or over any other part. The mental characteristics inherent or imminent in, in the ensemble as a whole. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything we create is a part of this imminence, and Eros moves there too. It is what plays on our bodies, connecting us to this larger system, reminding us, if we pay attention, of our responsibilities to it. Our paintings, ideas, and other creative forms are its effects. <clears throat> Excuse me. Susan Griffin, again, puts it this way. Ideas as well as poems, narratives of any kind, as well as stories, sounds of words, even alphabets, certainly numbers, exist in phys as physical entities, not only becoming flesh as they affect the thinker, the reader, speaker, or listener, acting as a kind of mortar for communities, families, peoples, but themselves emanating from and participating in an ecology of mind that is as much nature as our rocks and trees. Our bodies are the mediators of this complex system, with arrows created as the connective, passionate response to be translated into symbolic forms, whether these be graphic, oral, or literary, or, I don't know, on screens. <laughs> <laughs> this mind, thus, mind is not ours alone as human, and wisdom is intimately connected to eros, not its opposite. And now as I think back to and write about that day in the stream, the same circuitous system of differentiation is involved in creating this writing and this speaking, too. I've been moved by another related series, and its traces find their way here, to this page. The stream and the surrounding fields, the water, my paints, my little girl's hand and eye, and my translation in memory are all engaged in and part of this difference-producing circuit. The lay of the land itself, part of a long human history and its effects, creating the shores and the flow of the stream, geographic differences that make a difference, the fact that my grandfather fished and my friends and I rode our horses in it, and the human need for the bridge that the girls paints are also a part of this dynamic generative system and cannot be separated from the possibility that a painting would emerge there or my words here. And while these words or the painting once created are not the land itself, they would not be possible without it without my erotic and, re and emotional relation to it. There is nothing in this process that ensures the aesthetic success of the painting or the, production, or the protection of the stream or its inhabitants from harm. There is nothing essentially moral in the op operation of difference. The aesthetic and also the ethical success of any act require evaluation and choice a specific sort of discernment. As members of a culture, we are influenced by a larger social and cultural context that influences whether we engage such discernment or not, and if we do, how such choices will be made. So while I believe that this erotic poetics, integrally part of a larger ecology of mind, is at the heart of our protection of the commons, such a poetics is not so sufficient. It is simply the mediating moment of embodied connection, an intersecting point that might send us in the direction of an ethical, and I would add, educated response, or not. To revitalize or claim the commons, 
<clears throat> reclaim the commons. The erotic connection is a kind of embodied insistence or invitation that we act on such a love. That is, we will either recognize our relation to and reciprocal participation in a larger system, interpret it, name it, and choose to understand and protect it as an act of care and survival and love, or we will continue to destroy it. And often this path is clouded by the very symbolic and economic enclosures I was referring to earlier. We may feel love, but decide to do nothing, and not, or not know how to act on it. The path we take depends in large part on the questions that we learn to pose and the attention we learn to pay to the problems of well-being in life systems uh, that include but do not privilege human communities. Such a process of learning is created within intentional pedagogies of responsibility with teachers willing to engage their students in deep analysis of the cultural and ecological context we inhabit, um, we inhabit. Such teachers will also invite students to identify and imagine what their communities ought to be, what it could mean to revitalize their commons. The willingness to act with others as such is both what is necessary, even if not always successful, for a healthy and mindful commons to exist, but more specifically that it means to become educated. Our propensity to disavow, ignore, background, and hyper-separate ourselves from the erotic and ethical relationships to our communities and to the more-than-human world so ingrained in our Western mindset is at the heart of the destruction being wreaked upon the land and people and other creatures that inhabit this earth. It has been made of a complicated history of enclosure where powerful associations among industry, government, and a myriad of social institutions, including and perhaps especially schooling, not only privatize and control what was once the purview of local groups of people, but also the very symbolic system, the expert knowledge, the language, the daily practices that define us. But we have other choices in the behaviors and mindset we will live by, and this is where education, not socialization or indoctrination or even schooling comes in. I have written elsewhere that the pedagogical process that teachers and students are always engaged in is also made from this complex differentiating system that I've been describing. We meet in pedagogical relation and in the process of sharing information and attempting to make sense of it, we create an infinite no number of possible different translations and interpretations. This generative process that we engage with each other as humans happens all over the place, including schools, and, in, and is precisely what is at the heart of all thinking, all knowledge, all cultural creation. Moreover, while all the possible differences made in these relations are necessary, they are not sufficient for education. Instead, in order for a relationship to be called education, I argue, it must include the bringing of specific questions of responsibility and well-being to all the possibilities created within this complex difference-generating process. Education must be distinguished from pedagogy by the commitment to choose those practices and relations that help sustain well-being, even when the choice is not clear, or when we make erroneous choices. We will never be rid of the responsibility to make choices, and the questions we ask or the principles that support those questions are essential. Because I see education this way, as bringing forth an inherently ethical orientation to others, I believe that the traditional embodied responses to caring for each other and the earth implicit in the commons are inherently educational practices, and thus that education is inherently erotic, part of the same recursive system. We learn from each other how to choose among all the myriad possibilities those practices that work best to sustain ourselves in fragile, limited systems. And we experience such choices as a connective force in our bodies. Indeed, we experience our bodies, as Wendell Berry teaches us, as inextricably part of and made from the earth itself. Philosopher of education, Carrie Birch, writes that as passion and connection Eros is a state of being, an ardent desire, 
which provides the condition of possibility for an individual to be magnetized toward the vision of an imagined good. Education requires ethics, which requires that we use our interpretive powers to connect and love. Thinking back to my girlhood, I was both fortunate and lost. I was fortunate to have an extended family who knew enough to raise my sister, brothers, and I in a setting of diverse natural beauty and life, who told us stories connected to caring for this place, and who let us roam across it to our heart's content, experience and learn to love it deeply. But in spite of my family's own connections to the earth, the development of my eco-ethical consciousness was at best happenstance. Nothing that I recall in any part of my schooling, kindergarten through university through graduate school, taught me how to make sense of my erotic sensibilities about the places where I grew up. And it certainly was not oriented toward a commons. Indeed, if anything, I was schooled in division among states, nations, cultures, species, geographies, all laid out in neat maps and charts we were taught to believe in as real. Just imagine what might have been possible if that little girl of 10 were asked to connect her love of the stream and her art with what actually lives there, and if all that life were described and studied in terms of its biotic patterns of connections and difference to other living creatures included in her grandfather and including her grandfather and his farm, or her mother's knowledge. What if she were asked to also examine what patterns of belief and behavior disrupt and damage those intersecting life pro processes? And the kids in Detroit? What if in connection to the paintings, the Thurkle Elementary kids created, they were asked to think about the earth under the sidewalks as living soil that feeds the mature trees helping to clean the air depicted in more than one painting as black and needing first aid? What if they learned to think about life and death in terms of that soil, learned to test it for toxicity, and then connect that to the history of industrial power in their city, and with this learned the stories and knowledge their grandparents and great-grandparents brought with them from their farms in the South or even further back from Africa? Some of this is happening currently in Southeast Michigan through the efforts of organizations like the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, the James and Grace Lee Boggs Center, and the Southeast Michigan Stewardship Coalition. I wonder if I need to shift. Okay, we're close. <laughs> A necessary shift in language and behavior will not happen outside our attention to an intentional interpretation of that which touches us in the more than human world around us, those differences that make a difference. Teachers must begin to recognize the metaphorical nature of perception, framing their relation to the larger world, and these connections must be extended to life in cities, suburbs, and farming communities, and to our exploitive global actions as well. And they must begin to cultivate in their students a sense of eros as it is created in their day-to-day -day meetings with the more than human community. Eros in this sense is nothing less than the embodiment of an eco-ethical imperative in education. Thank you. <laughs>